Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Blue Ngo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hello, Louis. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so glad being here. Yeah, we're really excited to have you here, especially because we are in two very different parts of the world and somehow we are making it work. Uh, It is morning here in Melbourne and good afternoon to you in Miami, Florida. Thank you for your time. I know it's probably been a long day of work, but we're really, really excited to talk to you about happiness today. Yeah, we, we, we have to enjoy talking about happiness, right? Yeah, doesn't absolutely. Matter what time. yeah, absolutely. I love that. Doesn't matter what time, we're always going to enjoy it. So as we have a tradition on the show, we always ask our guests to introduce themselves instead of us reading a bio out because there's no better way for listeners to get to know you than from, from yourself. Um, so it'll be really awesome if you could share with everyone who you are as a professional, as a person, and your passion, and especially why you're here today to talk about happiness. Well, thank you so much. Um, when I actually, when, when, when I give talks, I ask this question, who I am? And, and I always try to get into the more the kind of the spiritual space, but I know that this is a more a professional uh, audience, but I want to combine a bit. So for example, for me, the answer is I am that, that I am. So it's really, I am whatever it is, whatever it is, is me. But then if we go deep more in a professional point of view, well, let me tell you that I am the president and the founder of the World Happiness Foundation and the World Happiness Fest, which is the largest forum of happiness and well-being in the world. And I've been in this journey of connecting and discovering uh, so much good going on in the in the world uh, for the now for the last years, and uh, I've been able to co-create, co-found a uh, program pr- programs such as the International Day of Happiness, Gross Global Happiness at the United United Nations University for Peace, and movements and ideologies such as Happy Delism. So basically, uh, from a professional point of view, I'm really focused on creating spaces for thought leaders, for professionals to interact and to share what what are the tools, what are the insights that we can use to live a more fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very awesome. It sounds like you live and breathe happiness, you know, Um, and I was actually eyeing your TEDx talk earlier and, you know, I could see the passion through what you were saying. And, you know, absolutely today we are going to learn a lot more about World Happiness Fest as well as, um, you know, your take on happiness. And for the topic of today, we are talking about flow because, you know, happiness is so broad. There's so much to talk about. And we know that for you, the perfect thing to talk about is probably flow. So before we go into the nitty bitty of flow, we would love to ask you to define flow in the context of happiness. How would you see flow? Yes, this is a great question. And I and this is one of those concepts that are so powerful by themselves that can completely change anybody's life and their communities. So I think that it's one of those concepts that if people are not familiar with it, I invite you to to go deeper into not just the definition, but actually how to get into states of flow. Because flow is a state. It's a state where 
we actually lose our inner critic. We are so relaxed and so focused and so immersed that time doesn't exist anymore. That we enjoy the last, even the last second of what we are doing, um, we really forget it at some point even who we are. It's one of those states where we connect our subconscious with our conscious and we really, really, really enjoy it. So I think that this is one of those concepts that athletes and um, very creative people uh, really understand because when you get into a state of flow is when you really maximize your performance. Uh, but the opportunity that we have now is that this concept can be democratic democratize it can be uh, accessed by everybody because we know how to get into those states so basically it's a state it's a state of fluidity where we really enjoy every second yeah that sounds amazing and it sounds like it brings happiness already you know just hearing about it already brings me a lot of happiness so i would love to learn more about that from you today and before we go and learn about flow about the practice as well as um, some of the key insights that emerge from your research and your work we would love to get to know you and i'm sure that listeners would love to get to know you as well and normally when we do that we do a thing called rapid fire questions and there are 10 things that we would love to know from you. It could be anything that pops into your mind, something recent um, or favorite thing of yours, um, just so the listeners know you more as a person. So are you ready? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. So the first key word is book. What comes to your mind? Which book comes to mind? Well, so many, but I think that uh, transcendental psychology is one of those those that really make a difference is the interconnection of anything and everything around wow. our minds. So, yeah. Okay. I will have to check that out for sure. Always love a good psychology book. <laughs> Number two is a movie that comes to your mind. Uh, many, but one of those, and very much linked as well to transcendental psychology, uh, is the Black Swan. Oh, I love the black swan. Such a good wow, movie. Wow, that's a, that's yeah. so powerful, right? It's yeah, it's a, really well done. How, yeah, how we can have uh, how we can learn from our shadows as well as from our gifts. Uh, yeah, the black swan. Yeah, I still remember back in the day when I watched it. It had so much chill. So <laughs> yeah, definitely a great one. Number three is a podcast that comes to your mind. On being. By Krista Tippett. Oh, that's, that's a new beautiful. one. Yeah, oh, that's beautiful, okay. beautiful, beautiful. You cannot miss it. It's yeah, a I really will fun. definitely have a listen. Very cool. And number four is a documentary that comes to your mind. Well, I really, I really love the um, uh, my teacher, the octopus, uh, from South African director. He actually got the the World Happiness Awards. And it's one of those documentaries that is uh, through the life of an, of an octopus, we understand ourselves. Oh, wow. And, and for one year, um, uh, he was researching and, and actually uh, swimming with this octopus. And it's so much that he learned from it uh, about himself and about actually how uh, octopus behave. So it's a beautiful one. I recommend that. Yeah, that sounds so fascinating, learning for ourselves through octopus. That's definitely very, very interesting. Number five is your famous role model. Well, I feel I, I have several ones, but actually one just passed. It's Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, and, I th I'm, and I'm sure you know him very well, uh, yeah. being from Vietnam, right? Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, he just passed six days ago. And yeah. he's a truly, he's, a, he's an amazing role model. He's, yeah. For me, it's the essence of how you can simplify something so complex as a state. is a state of happiness and flow, and he was so, so amazing uh, embodying yeah. it. So I think yeah. that the embodiment part of Thich Nhat Hanh is what really resonates with me. 
Yeah, that's true. It was a huge loss for us all. And I think there's still a lot to learn from him, even though he's gone. And, you know, it's, yeah, it hits his knowledge and insight are going to stay here with us forever. And I think that's the beauty of um, learning from our role model, right? Even though they're gone, we can still learn from them. All right. So number six is an app that comes to your mind. An app. Uh, I think one that is that keeps growing and doing it better and better is Calm. Mm. Uh, very famous yeah. nowadays. I mean, in the in the mindfulness and meditation space, there are many Insight Timer, Headspace, yeah, um, uh, Petit Bamboo. But Calm, I think that these guys uh, they know what they're doing, so I like it. Mm. Yeah, perfect. I love Calm as well. Number seven is a news website that comes to your mind. I would say food for the soul. And this is a blog okay. that we create at the World Happiness Foundation. So if you haven't checked ah. it out, just go there. World Happiness yeah. Foundation and it's food for the soul. Yeah. I think that we have beautiful content there. That's cool. It's very different because normally when we talk about news, everyone kind of goes, ABC News or, you know, like Seven News or whatever news website, but for you to share about, you know, food for thoughts and probably um, articles and things that we can learn from. I really enjoy that. I would love to check it out. Number eight, we would love to know a an artist that comes to your mind. Gustav Klimt. It's uh, one of my favorites. And now that we see all these emergence of NFTs, yeah, there is so much that can yeah. be done with Gustav yeah. Klein and, and NFTs because of the the way he actually created all mm-hmm. those combinations of colors and forms. So I love, yeah, Gustav Klein is one of my favorites. Oh, okay, very interesting. I'll check out his NFTs afterwards. Number nine is a course you have completed. Yoga philosophy. So, you know, when people think about yoga, they normally think about the, the, the physical yoga, is, the, is the, the postures that you use. But when you go deep into the essence and into the, the philosophy and the wisdom, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. So actually, I just, uh, I just completed a couple of years of study of philosophy of yoga, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty full now after that. <laughs> Yeah, well, that sounds wonderful. It sounds like you're taking steps to better your life and it's very inspiring. Number 10 is an event you have attended, probably before COVID. <laughs> well, you know, um, definitely World Happiness Fest. I mean, that's yeah. a must for yeah. everybody. <laughs> but you know, something that happened with COVID, instead of canceling our events, we we use online platforms. And thanks to that, now we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people joining from all over the world yeah. that otherwise wouldn't have had the opportunity to join. Yeah. So COVID actually accelerated the opportunity to get this message of hope and resilience to as many people as possible. So check it out, what happens best. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. A lot of these events, um, a lot of the times, someone, for example, for us in Australia, we might want to visit the U.S. And, and participate, but it's really hard, logistically speaking. But now, thanks to all the online platform, anyone and everyone could join from any part of the world. And, you know, that's beautiful. So if if there are some good things that come out of COVID, I guess that's one of the good things. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, Cool. Fantastic. Yeah, I would love to join the next event that you will have for World Happiness Fest for sure. Sounds like a a really uplifting event and I'm sure listeners would be keen to check it out. So next part is we're going to talk about your practice when it comes to flow and and happiness. Before we discuss the key research insights, we want to know the realistic practice that you do. So the first thing we would love to know from you is what is a practice that you do to cultivate your state of flow, knowing that it's such a great thing to achieve? Yeah, this is a great question because sometimes we, we got lost on theories 
and and we use the rational part instead of the experiential part and the practical one. So something that I've been doing, I've been doing it all, all my life is being uh, playing sports. So I, since I was eight, I was playing handball, handball, European handball. Actually, Australia is really good on handball. Um, and I became a coach when I was 14 years yeah. old. So I've been teaching and coaching and practicing sports. And something that you do a lot when you play sports is focus. So the, the, the act of con- concentration, when you focus on something, you concentrate. This is a first state of meditation. And some people think, well, meditation is boring because uh, we have to see it, because we have to free our mind from, uh, from thoughts. But actually, it's, it's not just that. Uh, the first state to get into deep states of calm and relaxation and, and, and flow is focus, is concentration. So I would uh, recommend everybody just to concentrate. In order to concentrate, you have to pay deep attention to one thing. Once you know how to do that, then you get in, you can practice contemplation. And contemplation is beautiful because contemplation is just about staying a bit longer with your focus, with your concentration. And at some point, something is going to happen. So imagine that now we are contemplating each other. Yeah. And at some point, I'm going to see your smile. And when I see your smile, something comes out of that. And then I think, well, what's that? And that's gonna bring some ideas into my mind. It's gonna be bringing, um, uh, maybe it's gonna spark some imagination. And something that would you do when you contemplate, you use that in order in order to integrate it with your life. So this is this takes a bit more of training, but it's beautiful because you see something happening after a few minutes, and then you do something. So you are using your mind in an active way. And then the third level is is meditation. And meditation is more about getting an understanding about your thoughts. They come and go, but at some point you are able to manage. Um, It's not controlling. It's not stopping your mind from uh, generating or accessing those thoughts. It's about being aware that they are happening. So I think when you combine concentration, contemplation, and meditation, there you have three techniques that can really help you to get into a state of fundamental peace. Yeah. So it's not just one practice, but it's it's a practice that encapsulates a lot of layers, of different layers for anyone who wants to try to achieve a state of flow. And I feel like it's it's really beautiful because sometimes it's hard when when this is such a new concept to some people or, you know, probably a lot more than we imagine. So for, for them to get from um, concentration to meditation, it might be a whole process, but then you kind of add another layer in between contemplation. So it's really good to start with concentration. Then yes. once you are aware of, of your concentration, move to contemplation and then finally move to meditation. It's definitely a process. And I think it's really different from the other kind of practices that we hear all the time. So what would you say to be the three good things about this p- practice? You know, it has three different layers. It's got to be a lot of benefits. Yeah, so many. And and this is something that once you start creating the habit of focusing, of contemplating and activating your mind as you contemplate and then letting your mind flow, then you start seeing the benefits. The first benefit is that you feel uh, with a sense of calm. And when and that's priceless. Just feeling that you are calm and that you can self-regulate your emotions, which is kind of the second benefit, is just huge. Because normally this is the first issue that we all have as human beings, which is how do we manage our emotions? And at some point, many, most people, I would say, cannot manage very, very strong emotions. Let's say anger, or let's say gust, or gust, or let's say um, even love. Uh, so at some point, if we don't know how to manage all these range of emotions, and there are more than 300, and normally we only name five or six, 
Uh, that self-regulation is coming from this type of techniques. And, but something super important is that when you get into a state of calm, you start listening to the silence. And when you are able to listen to the silence, that becomes a very powerful sound. So normally we think that silence is no sound. Actually, silence is one of the most powerful sounds that we have because it, it, it really embodies all other sounds. And actually, when you get into a state of calm, you can start listening to silence. And that gives us so much opportunity to build a more balanced life. So balance will be another benefit. So self-regulation, balance, state of calm. And with that, then you start becoming more creative. Mm. You start becoming a, even more engaged with what you do. You become and you become aware of many more things that you even you didn't realize before, and you become even more mindful. So I think the state you can get into a state of mindfulness once you understand awareness. Yeah. And all those techniques are giving us the opportunity to be aware. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think I completely agree with that because I remember there was a period, I think probably throughout the lockdown where it got really hard to be by myself. And I feel like a lot of people felt the same way. So I surrounded myself with a lot of noise. You know, when I was doing a task, I probably blast music, didn't really um, just do the task. And at a certain point, it was helpful. But, you know, it's it's not super duper helpful if you're not really concentrating on the task at hand because the noise creates a lot of of disruptions and I feel like it does not help you to be calm at all because you're constantly surrounded by noises and like you were saying you know silence is a beautiful sound and I think we should all learn to appreciate it more when we are concentrating contemplating and definitely meditating because you know that's where we're going to really connect with ourselves and the ripple effect is is real like you were saying right there's just so much benefit so much that people don't usually see so that's really great and everyone should definitely try this i think so yeah. we we talk about you know the benefit and and the many layers the many ripple effects but i know that for a lot of people it's hard as i mentioned before it's it's hard to get even into a state of concentration let alone meditation right so yes. From your work and, and from your research, what have you noticed to be the main challenges when people start to practice this? Yeah, this is a great question. And, and after a lot of research and going into so many different disciplines, from biology to psychology, philosophy, uh, and everything is interconnected in many ways, physics and, and even mathematics, uh, you realize that it's most of it is because we don't know how to do it. So it's, it's, it's a question of we have not been educated or trained to understand the signals, those signals. So the same way that, that we go to schools and we understand and we learn uh, geometry and algebra, we don't learn this type of we normally call soft skills. Um, but the reality, and we've seen this with COVID and the pandemic, is that what we call soft, key, soft skills are the skills. That, and those are really the skills that we need to navigate life, navigate life. So somehow we don't learn the fundamental skills to navigate life. And that's, that's the only issue. Because once we study and we practice them, and the cool thing about all this space that is all about practicing, so you can know a lot, you can go into research, but it's going to show you practical techniques all the time because it's all about techniques. So I think that this is the only thing that stops us from maximizing our full potential is knowing how to do it. And something that you realize and that you learn is that it's not about doing anything. It's about being. And this is so hard because we all distract ourselves every second doing things. It's like if we are not doing something, it's like we are not living. And that creates 
expect expectations. And the more expectations we have, the harder it is to achieve those and the harder it is to become into a state of flow because we raise the level of pressure that we put into ourselves. So at some point, if we are able to balance what we expect from something to what we accept. So this is the ratio between expectation and acceptance. Then we are starting to relax again. And as you see, this is all a, this, this all starts with a state of balance. So the key is how do we get into a state of balance? And each of us can get into it in a different way. That's the beauty. You can do it through cycling, through sports, through reading, through listening to music, but all that has to help us to get into another state. And that's the beauty of this journey is how we understand that we can live in different states at the same time, that this is a question of vibration, that this is a question of frequency, that this is a question of focus. And at the professional level, this is so relevant because sometimes we think, well, I, productivity is all, around, is all about using every minute to do something. Well, that's actually the opposite, mm. is using every minute to be, yeah, not to do anything. The moment that you are being, you are in the flow, the moment, the moment you are in the flow, you can achieve in 10 minutes what somebody needs 10 days to do. So this is, this is beautiful because I think the only thing that separates us from complete management of self-regulation, emotions, and ultimate performance is to know about the techniques. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, challenges come with solutions there as well, because as hard as it is, all you need to do is just be like you're saying. So, you know, that's, that's a great tip for everyone. And I feel like in this day and age, a lot of us don't know how to just be, you know, we're always constantly switched on and worried about things, having expectations. So just, you know, having that ability to just be would be a game changer for a lot of us. Um, and not just in the workplace, but in life, in everyday activity. So that would be really great for everyone to pick up on. And hopefully we'll have more people in the state of flow, you know, when mm -hmm. they start practicing to be. And you said that it's um, it's kind of a process, you know. It's a it's a three layer process where you you do um, you kind of go from just concentrating to meditating. But we would love to know how you make time for it, because it sounds like to you it comes really easy. But do you actually set up a certain time for it, or how do you incorporate it into your life? Yeah, this is a great question. And it's all about habits, creating habits. And we know that, for example, uh, we know that uh, brushing our teeth is, is very important. And this is one of those habits that we have our mother, our parents telling us every day, it's like brush your teeth, brush your teeth. But then you see the benefits. Yeah. Because once you do that, you know that, well, actually, uh, it, you feel fresh, you feel clean, and, and you avoid illness. The same, exact, exactly the same happens with our mental health. And our mental health is basically creating habits because we are talking about mental health. We are talking about how to have a mind that is a clear, a clear mind is what everybody really needs. And when we have a clear mind, we can see beyond. We can, we can understand much better and we, have, we can behave in a really productive way an inclusive way. So this is the benefit. The benefit is a clear mind. In order to get a clear mind, it, we have to create habits. And in this case, uh, what it works is like, if you want to work out, you go to the gym, you find the right timing. Uh, that's what you do with your mental health. The good news with the mental health is that you don't need to allocate uh, many, many hours during the day. Maybe you can do this in breaks. There are self-compassion breaks, it takes five minutes, and it's beautiful. It's a question of touching your, your, your head, you touch your face, you touch your heart. Just by doing this, you relax yourself, and it takes a minute. Or it's a question of 
basically stopping and breathing. But breathing six seconds and then holding four seconds. And then basically you do a cycle of six, four, six, four. That's it. So you do this 10 times, you are completely in another state. So I think that it's important that we understand that this is creating a habit and the habit can be created by repetition. And we all know now by research that it takes about 21 days to create the habit and 40 days to create new neuropaths. Because something else that we learn from science is that uh, we learn as we, as, uh, as our neurons create new neuropaths. And that's happened by repetition. The more we repeat something, the more we go deeper into the creation of those neuropaths. So that's why between 21 days, 41 days, uh, we create completely new habits. That's all it takes. Once you create a new habit, then you start feeling better. And once you find the right technique for you, then you combine habit, which is space and time with technique. And that's the way you can you can maximize impact. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is what we all need to do, right? Curate habits. And I think that is something that have been talked about quite a bit in the past year, especially if anyone's familiar with James Clear's Atomic Habits. I think it was such a great book. And I was actually listening to a podcast about it today as well. Um, and it's, it's a great reminder, right? It's not like something that's going to happen overnight. The second you drop it, it's not a habit anymore. So it, it's about building it and keeping it up. So we know that we need to curate that habit. We know that we need to keep it up so that we can always have um, sort of a, a sense of calmness and we have a state of flow when we do important work and important things in life. But everyone is so busy nowadays, don't you think? And it's just kind of really hard whenever we bring up a new thing, a lot of people kind of go, oh, I, I don't know how I'm going to find time for it, even though it sounds so great. So for you, you know, having so many things on your plate, how do you make time for it? Can you share some tips with our listeners? Well, I think one one thing that works so well for me is to put it on my calendar. Mm. So this is very practical. Yeah. But we know that at the corporate level, we all have calendars. And we, we all know that and especially in this case, and, and I've been at the corporate level working at the, as a top executive for a long time, at some point, if it's, no, if it's not in your calendar, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So it has to be in your calendar. Yeah. So something very practical is that you block your calendar. So I still remember I love tennis. And I organize my calendar around tennis. So I, I block and I say, I play tennis then let's say 12 p.m. Thursdays and Tuesdays. That's in my calendar. And then if somebody wants to have a meeting, it's around that. So we have to be able to carve out the space in our calendars and we have to put it and we have to show it to everybody. Yeah. It's like this is life work integration. It's yeah. not balance of work and life. It's the integration of your work in your life. But the most important is your life. Once everybody knows that the most important is your life, then work is going to be in your calendar. So yeah. these are very practical ways, like blog. So find the right moment. I live by the ocean. So for me, for example, doing a late. I don't do early a, because in the morning I prefer... Uh, doing a, a meditation, uh, yeah. but but basically uh, basically in bed, so I I stay there. But then in late night or late evening, I do a walk, and I do that by the ocean. So wow. that's my moment. And yeah. at some point, I even get into the ocean and I stay there for a few seconds under water, and I do a super deep, less than a minute uh, meditation under water. Mm -hmm. Wow. That for me, that's like an hour uh, or yeah. two hours of meditation, that minute. Something yeah. important as well for, for those who want to go really, really deep into deep change is that even though you do five minutes or six minutes, it's good. 
if you really want to create change, you have to meditate for more than 45 minutes. Yeah. So this is something for everybody who really wants to go serious. It's like going to the gym for five minutes. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a nice warm up. Yeah. But you are going to need something else. So I think if you are able to combine physical uh, sports with mental health uh, habits, that's that's how you maximize. And in this case, in my personal case, that becomes part of my daily routine. So it's in my yeah. calendar. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, and it sounds like a dream, you know, to meditate underwater. In fact, the other day, I actually went to the beach here as well on a really hot day in Melbourne. And I had this, like, uh, I think about 10 minutes of swimming and just submerging in the water. And I felt the same thing that you just described, you know, a lot of peace. And it felt like an hour of meditation, even though it was just such a short period. And yeah, I think the, the power of being in the ocean is just not something that we talk about very often, but it's amazing. And yeah, it definitely helps because I feel like we're away from all of our devices, you know, away from all of our worries and it's a whole different world, right? Um, so yeah, that's great. If anyone could, you know, please go <laughs> to the ocean and try and meditate for a little bit. That would yeah, that'd be yeah, really that's my, But Lou, that's my personal practice, but you know, nature, nature yeah. in general heals. And they so much research. And nature is just hugging a tree. I mean, yeah. even if you only have one tree yeah. by your side, that's all you need. You need a plant. You need a tree. So you don't need a, just to to say, okay, if, if, if I don't have an ocean, I cannot do that. No, you can do this by being in nature. And if it's not possible right now, there is, a, there is another cool opportunity, which is VR, is virtual reality. And this is happening right now. Virtual reality is healing because you are, your brain actually, that's, that's part of the research as well, doesn't um, differentiate between doing the real thing, being in nature, that actually um, uh, seeing that from a virtual reality perspective. So there are, there are other benefits by being physically in nature that are not your mind. But in this case, with virtual reality, we can recreate. And in the case that you cannot move from home, mm -hmm. and this happens with sure. many people that uh, get sick. I mean, and we, with COVID, we've seen this. Many people will stay weeks and weeks at the hospital. Virtual reality is another opportunity as well. Yeah. Yeah. So there are options there, right? If you can yes. go to the ocean, if you don't have the ocean near you, go out in nature. And if not, if you're just stuck at home, virtual reality. So lots of options there to start, you know, cultivating um, this practice in your life. And I think one of the most important things is happiness, right? We've talked about the benefits, the many benefits of this practice. We know that it helps you to be more mindful. You are going to be able to do things much more efficiently. But how about your level of happiness? Yes, happiness is, is one of those uh, words that has many meanings yeah. and it means different things for different people. The way, the way I understand this and this is the way that is kind of the, the way the science is, is going around is a state of mind and is subjective well-being. So when, do, when, when we do research, we, we define happiness as that subjective state of being where you feel well. Uh, and then, uh, for me, the importance of happiness is not to be happy, it's to be happiness. Because when you are happiness and you're in the nest, you embody it. And when you embody it, that's the moment where you can make an impact for yourself and for others. And for me, the most important factor of being happiness is to share it. Because that's the that's the way you uh, you move all that wave of opportunity, of hope to as many people as possible. Now we understand exponential factors, exponentiality because of COVID. We've seen how cases were moving from one to millions yeah. in question of days. That's, that's called the, an exponential or singularity effect. With happiness is the same. 
there is a ripple effect and it multiplies. That's why the opportunity that we have to create societies where everybody can flourish is by sharing happiness. But in this case, just to have a common and ground of how to define it and how to understand it is a state of mind and is subjective well-being. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. I guess in this context, I would the way I would interpret it is when you are looking to achieve a state of flow and you see the benefits and you share it with your loved ones, um, it will create happiness and bring bring happiness to yourself and everyone around you. And you embody happiness as well because you're sharing what's what's great, right? You're not, you're not just keeping it to yourself. And because it is so great, everyone should benefit from the practice. So would you who would you recommend this particular practice to? You know, there's quite a bit of work there, right? It's not an easy practice. It's definitely um, a new thing for a lot of people. So who would you recommend this to? Well, I would definitely recommend this to everybody, but if we have to start with somebody, I would recommend this to managers, to every manager, every person who has responsibility over other people. Yeah. Because when we look at unhappiness at work, we see that there are so many people unhappy. Yeah. And one of the fundamental factors is because they don't like their manager. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, but this is so simple, but so powerful. It's like, imagine that we then look at these managers as country leaders, yeah, as government officials, yeah, as sure. any kind of leader who has the opportunity to create the conditions for people to flourish, and they don't do it. So what they are doing is not just stopping people from having the opportunity, to accelerate their own happiness, actually they are stopping people from contributing even more to society. So I think the first people who should really know how to manage and self-regulate their emotions and how to create the conditions to happiness are managers and leaders. So we'll focus on them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you're absolutely right because they in turn will bring either happiness or suffering to other people that work with them. And, you know, those people have families and friends and, you know, it's a ripple effect once again. So, yeah, I think you're right. You know, the people in leadership position should start uh, adopting this practice so that they can create better environment for everybody around them. Um, and then the flow will continue. So that's perfect. <laughs> so we talk about the many layers of this practice. It's not a simple and easy practice as, um, as other practice that we've talked about on the show so far. But based on your experience, what would you recommend to combine it with? Would there be something so simple that we could just sort of combine them together and people can start, you know, practicing some other things alongside this practice to get to mm -hmm. the state of flow and happiness? Yes, um, it looks complex at some point, but that's because um, maybe we don't differentiate between happiness and the activators of happiness. And this is very important for everybody. One thing is the state. Another thing is what activates the state. Yeah. And, and that's when we can do so much. For some people, it's eating chocolate. Well, that creates an opportunity and activates a state. Yeah. For some people, is walking in nature. Mm. For some people, is having a really good friend. Yeah. And actually, when we look at the longest study ever in the history of happiness, it's, it's been running for more than 75 years. The, and run by Harvard a University, the one main reason why people are happier during their life is because they have meaningful relationships. So get a friend, make a friend. So, but that's not easy. <laughs> it's like, how do you have a good, good friend? Yeah. Well, that's something that really, that really can help you uh, for sure. But actually there, I like to talk about five steps into getting a state of flow. And again, 
tell you them, them very, very quickly, but it's, it's kind of you do this and you can get into a state of flow. The first one is that you find one task that you feel is rewarding, rewarding mm-hmm. to you. Yeah. So this is very important. If you do things that don't bring any rewards to you, that they don't bring any fulfillment to you, it's not going to work. Yeah. So find one thing that actually redeems that intrinsical, intrinsical rewarding. Then you set a clear goal. And then you see that you have a sense of progress. So you choose one task and then you set the goal. Is what do I want to achieve with that? And then get feedback. Yeah. So choose the task, goal, you get feedback. And then when you feel that uh, that task is becoming a challenge, that's the moment that you have to realize that you are ready for that, that your yeah. skills uh, actually match and you don't have the right skills, then it's going to be a challenge. And if that challenge is not managed, then you're not going to improve. So this is about you doing tasks where you have some skills, but you don't have all the skills. And then the fifth step, the last one is that you focus on it. Yeah. You focus on it intensively. So you go through those five steps and you get to flow. Sooner or later, you get to flow. Yeah. But then there's your concentration, right? And then concentration. And then in the process, you have contemplation. And in a way, it's kind of meditation too. You know, if you're focusing on the task and um, you're in a state of flow, I feel like sometimes something so simple as washing your dishes in silence could be meditation in a way. And you're in the flow, you know, that's it. Sometimes it's that simple. Yeah. Well, Louis, that's really great. Thank you for sharing the practice. It's a it's a really comprehensive practice, and I feel like I will I will definitely go home and reflect on this in a lot of details, and you know, apply in my life, and definitely share it with others. So we touched on this earlier, and and I think I really love that you you know beginning of the show you already said you know it's, we can always talk about happiness. So I think I would like to crown this. You know, it's always happiness hour. You know, when is happiness hour? It's, it's always. So we, we are in the happiness hour with you and we want to talk to you about happiness. And you already touched on um, having happiness or being happiness even. And you also said that each person has their own definition of happiness, which is absolutely true. So to you, once again, if you don't mind, what is your definition of happiness? Yes, my definition is uh, understanding that is a state. How do we get into a state of happiness? Uh, and, and that's the definition. And for me, it's combining our skills with our purpose. And it's a purpose that goes beyond ourselves. Yeah. Okay, so I think this, this is where you get to ultimate, let's call it happiness, is like, you are combining that strengths, the strengths that you have, the skills that you have and the talents with a purpose that goes beyond you. And normally this is about serving others. Yeah. And that's ultimate happiness. And this is something else that I think is so profound, but we haven't realized is that uh, you, you see uh, what people do for work and you analyze every single work you realize that we work to serve others. So for example, this podcast, and why are you doing this podcast? Because you want to get uh, people more informed, access, empower. You want to uh, bring knowledge to people. You're serving other people. Yeah. However, if you confuse and you don't even realize that you're serving people, then you can make it basically a nightmare for yourself if at some point you are thinking about the practicalities of doing the podcast, it's like, is the sound working? Is not working? And you become so obsessed yeah. with the technicalities that you forget that actually you are doing this to serve other people. It's yeah. the same with lawyers. It's the same with architects. It's the same with the police. It's the same with almost everybody. I mean, it's very difficult to find one job that yeah. is not about serving others. 
However, we don't see our jobs as serving others. Yeah. We see our jobs as a source of income. Yeah. Many people. So that's completely disconnection. Yeah. And this is a disconnection that we have from ourselves. Yeah. So when we connect with ourselves, and that's part of my definition of happy talism, which is a new paradigm uh, that I've been uh, working on for over the last years, is a state where you are connected to yourself. You know, to connect to yourself, you have to realize that you are not connected. And this example of not understanding that our work is about serving other people, and in the end, is our our whole life is about serving other people. If we don't realize that, we are disconnected. If we are disconnected, we don't maximize our own happiness. So it's a long it's a long definition, but um, but I think it, I, I like to yeah I like to understand happiness this way. Yeah, I think that's beautiful because. You're right. A lot of the times we are so caught up in our day to day that we forget why we do the things that we do. And for me, it's it's similar. Sometimes I have to remind myself, hey, this podcast is serving people. I get to share knowledge with people. At the same time, I get to make an income and support myself. So it goes both way. You know, we're all winning. It's easy to just think about, oh, I'm just doing this so that I can make some incomes and support myself. Or I could look at it in another way and I kind of go, you know what? It's great because I not only get to support other people, I get to support myself too. And, you know, the joy continues and there's happiness there. And I think one of the famous sayings that we always hear is happiness is only real when shared. It's kind of like similar to that as well. So. Yes. You know, thank you for sharing about that. And thank you for mentioning happy talism. Uh, we we do want to ask you about that for sure, because it's such a new thing. And I think a lot of people will benefit from, from this. So we'll go into that in a bit. But in the meantime, we would love to hear from you in terms of the misconceptions when it comes to happiness. Perhaps we already touched on this a little bit when we talk about how people get so caught up in doing the work that they're doing because they need to support themselves and they forget about the fact that they're actually serving others because all jobs serve someone, right? We're yeah. all serving people. It's just whether we we register that and we remember that or not. So what are some other misconceptions when it comes to happiness? Well, I, I think a big one is that we have to be happy all the time. Yeah. And if we are not happy all the time, we are not... we we are not achieving the goal. So this is something else that research shows. The more you chase happiness, the more unhappy you become. Yeah. So this is a big misconception because in order to achieve a state of happiness, you have to do many other things. You have to share, you have to give, you have to be thankful, you have to appreciate life. You have to have a purpose that you understand. And purpose, by the way, this is very important. It's another miscon miscon misconception related to happiness. People think that fo that purpose is doing something. People think that the purpose is having a vocation. It's like, oh, my purpose is to be a doctor. No, that's not purpose. Purpose is being something. And being is very easy. Because in order to be, you don't need to do anything. Yeah. So when you when we discover that it's so easy to go deeper into ourselves and understand our purpose by being, then we completely change our mindset. Because this is a big misconception that is creating so much stress to so many people. It's like not knowing what their purpose is. So I think when we combine meaning, purpose, and happiness, that's a lot of misconceptions around that. So the first one is don't chase it. It's about a journey. It's about walking the talk. It's about embodying fundamental behaviors and attitudes such as self-compassion, such as gratitude, forgiveness. It's about love. Once you go into that path, then you feel really good and you get into that state. And then something important is there are many activators of that state. So I think that once once we, we understand 
and we break with that misconception, which is I have to be happy all the time, you know, to be happiness or be happy. We relax a lot. We really relax. And then we don't have to keep posting happy pictures on Instagram when we are sad <laughs> because, because we, we know that actually sadness is so important to achieve happiness. We cannot be ultimately happy. We are not sad. And, and because sad is that state where we go deeper into who we are. Yeah. That's the moment where you go deeper into your personal uh, growth and your personal development. That's the moment where you start growing from your uh, suffering and your shadows. This is the beautiful. When, when people go into that state, they can achieve happiness in a, in a longer state as well and in a deeper state. So that I would say that that's a big mix, misconception as well. Yeah. Very interesting. That's very true. I think I had that conversation with a friend the other day and it was similar. You know, we, it, it's kind of like the happiness trap. When you hear happiness, you're kind of like, oh, I have to be happy. You know, like that's the goal in life. But no, we cannot be happy all the time, like you were saying. And it's just, it's a state, right? We, we, th we thrive and strive to, you know, achieve the state, but it doesn't mean that when we're not happy, that's it. There's nothing else. There's so much more and you'll learn so much from, from going through whatever it might be, it might be pain, it might be sadness before you feel the happiness. So I think it's, it's a great reminder for a lot of people. You know, if you don't feel like you are in a state of happiness or you don't feel like you embody happiness at the moment, that's totally okay. You know, it's just a temporary moment in time and it'll pass. So it's totally, it's totally okay. And, and let me relax even more yeah. and tell people that research shows that there are people with more predisposition to happiness than others, because yeah. that's part of our genes. That's part of our genetics. It doesn't mean that we cannot change it. We completely can change. Epigenetics is all about understanding how we change, how we change our genes uh, through behavior. And that's completely possible. But the reality is that there are people who are more predisposed yeah. to happiness than others. So that's why we are not all equal in this journey. And this yeah. is a very personal journey. And it's a personal journey worth exploring. And, and something very important is that if our only goal is to be happy, our only goal is to be rich, from a wealthy point of view, we are we are combining both misconceptions and misunderstandings. Yeah. You get to those states of ultimate wealth and happiness when you do something else, and that something else has to has to fulfill yeah. your ultimate purpose. So this is the this is the big journey for all of us. Yeah, that is so true. I couldn't agree more. It's a great reminder for a lot of people, especially in, in today's, you know, society. It's kind of like we have so much pressure to be someone and, and do things and, you know, be wealthy. And that means we're happy. But no, that's not, not true at all because we see so many miserable, wealthy people. And now that we've touched on happiness and you've kind of set the scene for us to, to understand happiness through your lens, we would love to talk to you about the flow state because that's what we're here to talk about today. When we're in the flow state, um, how do you think it affects our happiness, our level of happiness? We touched on this a, li a little bit earlier, but we want to kind of go into more details because we wonder if the flow state could bring us peace and happiness. And if so, could you let us know a little more about the details of the, what the flow state could bring? Because, you know, it's so beneficial for people. Yes, the, and this is, a, this is a fantastic question. Um, getting into a state of flow, it took, a, it took a lot of science and a lot of research. And, and, and probably you, I mean, I'm sure you know, and, and many of the, Listeners know that it was Mihaly, Six Sek Mihaly, who who actually did the most research on the status flow. And he was actually very motivated thanks to a meeting and knowing uh, Carl Gustav John, which is 
one of the uh, super important psychologists that brought transcendental psychology into life. So when we are talking about that space, we are talking, we are in the space of consciousness. We are in the space of making a difference because between the conscious level, the subconscious level, and then there is even an unconscious level or super conscious level. I mean, there are so many different uh, layers of consciousness. Actually, in India, uh, they say that there are more, more than 1,000 layers to consciousness. But in this case, if we just think of three layers, uh, it's basically I am aware of what's going on to the level, to one level. So I know what's going on. Um, but that's no more than probably 4% of our consciousness. Most of what's going on is under our consciousness, is what we call unconsciousness or, sub or subconsciousness. And that's 95% of things. And that's a lot going on because there you have um, the collective consciousness, the collective subconsciousness, the interconnection of uh, emotions, the mirror neurons. You have so many different layers that go beyond our consciousness that humanity is still exploring. We don't even know what's behind. We normally focus on the brain and the way our brain works. So actually what, what Mihaly and many researchers discover is that when you practice how to get into a state of fluidity because you are enjoying every second, as we spoke before, you are connecting your subconsciousness with the consciousness. And the benefits are incredible. They go from, of course, better emotional regulation to greater fulfillment and enjoyment, a greater sense of happiness. You improve your intrinsic motivation. You have greater engagement. You improve your performance. You improve the way you learn and develop your skills. You increase your creativity. Why? Because you are tapping into space and normally is beyond your consciousness. So this is the beauty of getting in the flow, is being able to connect what we know and what we don't know. And that's the power of flow. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah, that's very interesting because from what I'm hearing, it's it sounds like there's a lot of benefits and the little things all add to our happiness, right? It's not about one particular thing. It's not like, oh, you're in a state of flow and you're happier. It's not like that. But it's more like when you're in a state of flow, you achieve multiple things. You're more aware, you know, you're you're there, you know, you're present and you achieve so many different things. You're more efficient, effective. Um, you're probably a better human and all of that, all the, all the little things contribute to our happiness because it's not, I feel like it's not just one big thing. You know, th there's a big label there, but it's not just one thing. So it's really great to hear the many benefits of the state of flow and learn a bit uh, more background about it as well. I have to admit a lot of the information you said is new to me and I think they're new to listeners as well. So we've talked about the benefits of getting into the state of flow. And now I'm a bit more curious about how it actually looks like. So mm -hmm. say if I were to go in public and, you know, go for a stroll um, and I see people exercising or maybe chatting away or maybe working on something, how would I know someone is actually in the state of flow? What does it look like? Well, I'm sure you've seen many, many people. Um, yeah? Well, how does it look like? I mean, you have to tell me and, and we, I mean, I can give you an example and you give me another one. For okay. example, uh, you go to Facebook and you see these people who are doing a skateboarding. Yeah. And they go through the street, basically like a wave. They yeah. are moving from right to left. And they are going into the middle of the streets, but they look so relaxed, so calm. They are, and you see, they are enjoying every single millisecond of what they do yeah. because they are they are in the flow. That's yeah. the flow where they don't even know who they are. Yeah. They forgot about themselves. They drop the inner critic. They yeah. basically 
uh, got into something where they can be for hours and they are not going to realize that they've been there in, in, in hours. So that's one example. What, but dancing, dancing is another thing. I mean, I'm sure you know people, and I don't know you like dancing, but it can be dancing for hours and hours yeah. and hours, nonstop. Yeah. And movement, by the way, uh, it's critical for getting into states of flow. So when you move, you're, in, you're moving your energy, the energy. So actually that energy is what is going to be helping you to get to those states. Yeah. I think that uh, when you're painting and you are basically so focused on seeing how the brush is going from one place to another and you see that suddenly something is coming out of that painting that you didn't even, even know what you were painting and suddenly you see something there, that's coming from your state of flow because that's coming from your subconscious as well. So I think those are examples. Um, tennis, we just had the US, I mean, the Australian Open a few yeah. days ago, five hours and 35 minutes playing tennis. These guys were in a state of flow all the time. Yeah. It's like, it didn't matter. Yeah. Actually, Medvedev, if you remember, he asked Nadal, aren't you tired? No, he wasn't tired. He didn't even, re he didn't even realize that he was playing for so long, so hard, uh, with all his heart because he was in a state of flow. Yeah, that's true, actually. I went to see uh, soccer for the first time ever in Australia and in, in my life, in person. Never saw soccer before, you know, being Vietnamese, we love soccer so much. I never saw soccer in person. And that was a, a match between Australia and Vietnam, actually, interestingly enough. And I realized how crazy it is because every single player was in the flow. They kept running, you know, they kept looking out for their teammates and they just didn't really care about anything else. And the whole game, it was it was a really good game, even though Vietnam lost. It was a good game and everyone was in the flow. And yeah, I think I think you're right. It's really easy to recognize because I feel like when someone is in the flow or when you see a group of people in the flow, it means that they are intensely focused and they are just, you know, enjoying themselves. Or in other words, they are just enjoying what they are doing, enjoying the task at hand, and that's all they focus on. You know, they don't re they don't really care for the cheer that goes on in the background or um, you know, all the comment commentary that goes on. It's just about them playing. It's as if that they, they were the only 22 people there, even though there were thousands of people cheering on. It was it seems like there were just the 22 of them. It was amazing. So that is great. Now we've clarified what it looks like, and hopefully um, that helps our listeners to um, notice this more. I think noticing it is definitely the most important step because once we're aware of uh, the presence of the flow state, it's easier for us to also try and get into the flow state. So you, you talk about the practice that you normally do earlier and you know some steps that you can kind of combine it with. But if we were to break it down, not just a practice, but if we were to break it down in generic terms, how would you say we could achieve the state of flow step by step? Yes, this is uh, very much um, related to the five steps that I mentioned before. Yeah. Uh, but there are other ways. So before we said, choose something that is rewarding for you. Yeah. Set a goal, very clear. Yeah. And you see progress, and then you get feedback. Yeah. Then basically, uh, you have to see your skills matching, so you don't get you don't get bored, or you don't get sorry, uh, uh, overexcited. So you get bored about what you are doing. You don't see that challenge. Then it's going to be difficult to get into a state. So yeah. even if apathy, I mean, at some point you are doing some ta some task and they are completely uh, uh, outside what challenge you to go to the next level. But if it's very, very hard, you become anxious. Yeah. And if you become anxious, then that's not good either to get into a state of flow. So you have to find the right balance between I'm bored of doing this or I'm anxious doing yeah. this. You have to go in between. Yeah. And then uh, 
having that intense focus. Sports is very easy uh, to help us to get into flow because you really focus. Um, for example, if, if some of the listeners like skiing, skiing is one of those sports when you know the technique, it's super easy to get into flow because yeah. it's about the speed that you have, it's about the control of, in this case, the skis, and it's about enjoying nature. So that gives you so many ingredients to get into a state of flow very, very quickly. That's why people can stay skiing for hours and hours and hours and hours. They don't feel tired because they are really, really enjoying. So I, and, and they are very, very focused. But running marathons is another, is another one. Uh, or running just uh, uh, one, one kilometer, whatever. The moment you align that uh, task at hand with one goal and you see progress, with having feedback of how you're doing and then not being bored, not being anxious and focusing, that's how you achieve flow. Mm. So multiple ways we can get there, right? There, like you said, not just one set of steps people can try to achieve flow, but there are multiple other ways. And it's great to have options because sometimes we can feel like there's just a lot that's going on. And when we try something new, it's kind of daunting. It's a bit, you know, people are a bit hesitant to try new things. So like Louis said, everyone, you have different options. You can try mm -hmm. the five steps. Or you can try the, sim the more simple version. Maybe try getting into sports uh, and just do other things. Um, for each person, right, it's different. Not everyone's a fan of sports, but perhaps you know, if you have an activity that you really, really like and it could help you achieve a state of flow, for sure. Some people like writing. Some people like reading. Maybe that could be you know, the first step to achieving your state of flow, whatever that might look like to you. Yeah. So that's really cool. And I think we have talked about the pandemic situation a little bit earlier, but now let's dig a little bit deeper into this because obviously now with the pandemic, still ongoing, still unpredictable. A lot of people feel a lot of anxiety, you know, and I feel like when, when, whenever we do anything, we just, we just feel anxious because in a way we want to stay connected, but in other ways we don't because it's, it's out there, right? All the news and all these little things that kind of get you disconnected with the world. So I personally think from what you've told us, it is so important and more important now than ever that we achieve this state of flow. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a great question. And this is something that for this, I, I think for this, for the first time in, in human history, everybody in the world, every single human being, and I would say every being <laughs> is going through a state of trauma. Yeah. So it's, it's beyond COVID. It's, COVID has pushed us, not just COVID, but the measures that we've taken yeah. to, to address the issue have taken the whole humanity into a state of trauma. And, and that's beyond anxiety. Is I mean, we feel the pain. We feel the pain because many people around us die. Yeah. So this is not like, well, it's happening to somebody else. No, it's happening to all of us in many cases. Uh, people lost their, their jobs. Uh, other people did better than ever before. Uh, some people under the lockdown had time to go deep into themselves and to know them a bit more, but many, many people fell, fell even, even more anxious. So actually, as, you, as we saw before, anxiety is not good for flow. Anxiety is at the stream, and if we don't manage our anxiety, it's very difficult to get into a state of flow. So this is this is very important. It's like as we saw before, we have being bored, boredom, and anxiety. Those are the two extremes to basically not to get into state of flow. So the closer we get into the balance, the better. In order to get into balance. We have to understand very deeply why we get anxious. Yeah. And in this case, anxiety 
is coming because of different reasons under COVID. Normal anxiety is coming because we want to get this, we want to pass this. This morning I was talking to somebody, it's like, okay, in my mind, this is already over. I cannot handle this any longer. So it's the, for me, now it's like, it doesn't exist. Well, it exists. It's still, it's still there. It's, but you have to accept that it exists and it's changing our reality. So the moment we accept that this is changing our, re our reality and that we have to change our expectations, that's the moment you can start getting into a state of calm. And that's the moment where you are going to get into a state of flow if you do something that is meaningful for you. So I think this is very complex because we are putting a lot of pressure among each other in order to solve something that takes time. Yeah. And if something we are learning is that we have to be patient. And it's something we are learning as well is that we don't want to be told what to do. And what we are feeling here is that governments and institutions are telling us what to do and we are losing our freedom. So this is a complex, really complex situation because, and, and this, is, this is part of what, what I think, why we need new paradigms for human progress, because one of the keys to capitalism and to create pro prosperous and new paradigms is to be free. Uh, and right now we are feeling the opposite. We feel fear and we feel that we are not free to choose. Yeah. So that's what is creating so much anxiety because people feel that they cannot choose what to do. And if you don't accept that this is impermanent, so there is nothing permanent in the world. Everything changes. Yeah. Sometimes it takes one minute. Sometimes it takes a decade. But things are impermanent. Yeah. So I think that when we understand that right now, we feel a lot of anxiety because we don't think we are free to choose because fear is all over the top. Fear to everything, uh, but especially is fear to lose what we had before when we are really lost it because what's going to happen tomorrow has nothing to do with what we were doing two years ago. Yeah. I think this is a, is a is an interesting combination of all these factors, but I would say as soon as we recognize that we feel anxious because we are losing our freedom to be and actually we acknowledge the fear that is driving us, then we can get into another state of consciousness. Yeah. And then that's when we link to happiness. Because their happiness is going to be the activator for us to get out from that sense of lack of freedom or from that sense of I don't understand what's going on. So it's a very complex but a really, really fascinating, fascinating space because collective trauma can only be resolved through collective healing. So this is very important. Now we have to go through communities and we have to heal in teams and in groups. That's the way we can get out from this. We have to get out from this together. And the, the more we play an individualistic role, the more pressure we are going to put to our people, to our peers. So this is about group. This yeah. is about yeah. leadership. That's why I was telling about focusing on managers, because this is we are going to get out from this uh, pandemic, an epidemic, an infodemic, as a group, as a team, as a community. And this is the whole human race. Yeah, absolutely. We're not able to just get out of it ourselves. You know, it's, it's a collective and we're going to do that together for sure. And I think what I understand from what you're saying is even though it's hard to achieve a state of flow when you're feeling so anxious or bored in the pandemic situation, it's even more important because it will help you heal from the trauma as well. Because that's how you're going to be able to do meaningful things. That's how you're going to be able to find your balance. Or, you know, you you go and you find your balance 
and then get into the state of flow so that you could be a better person. You know, you can finally be mindful and, and do things that probably in the pandemic, you just completely forgot how to, you know, it could be so simple as talking to your loved ones. I know this because, you know, I've, I've been through all the stages of, you know, lockdowns and everything. And yeah, it was, it was great to be able to catch up with family and friends, but then to a certain point, everyone got Zoom fatigue. They might've fallen off the wagon. They just don't call anyone. So, you know, that's how we got off balance. And there are probably a lot of other anxieties that just stop people from doing simple things like that, like talking to their loved ones. So now that we understand how important it is to get back into our balance and our flow, then we need to slowly do simple things to find our balance. And once we have found our balance, then I think we will automatically somehow have that headspace to do things that we love and get into the flow, right? Because when you're so anxious, you're probably not going to be able to pick up a book and focus on the words that are in front of you. But once you've found your balance and you have clarity in your head, it's much, much easier. So that's my understand, uh, <laughs> my understanding as a, you know, everyday person. So hopefully our listeners will benefit from that as well. And the final thing we want to talk to you about today, which is, you know, the work that you do, I find it to be really fascinating. You also mentioned about happy tellism in our um, conversation earlier, but I know that you talk about it a lot on um, your website, you know, when you do public speaking. So without giving it, you know, a, a really quick reference, let's go deep into it. Can you let us know more about happy tellism? What is it and how can we reach that state? through flow? Yeah, thank you so much for, for that question. Uh, and, and this is very interesting because if we look at the history of humanity, uh, basically we as humans have been deciding the systems that we use in order to organize our resources. And at some point, the, we had feudalism. And sometimes we talk about communism, sometimes we talk about socialism, sometimes we talk about imperialism. Sometimes, I mean, there are so many isms that we all know that that's fluid as well. So the way we got into this capitalist system is as an evolution. Yeah. I think that uh, well, what, what I mean by, by capitalism is a system that basically maximize happiness for everybody. Uh, and it's not based on maximizing revenues and wealth. So right now, uh, we are living in a system where basically your value is related to what you have. Uh, in capitalism, the value is related to who you are as a being. And the beauty is that we all are already without doing anything. That means that that's an equalizer. Basically, everybody is born with everything. Something that is very important with, with this new paradigm is that it's based on abundance instead of lack. So something that we learn from systems is that normally they reduce the access because that generates premium and that generates more revenue, and that generates more demand. The less you have of something uh, that is needed, the more people are gonna pay for it. Well, that's the opposite of what the world is. Because if we, if we look at nature, nature is abundant. If we humans didn't live on earth, nature would be uh, exuberant. It would be just fascinating. It would be yeah, beautiful. So true. I think that is humanity that is really extracting the resources without giving back. And that's based on lack. It's like, I'm lacking this. I have to get it. I have to own it. However, when we think about abundance, and, we, and that's the first step, is an abundance mindset. It means that there is enough and there is more, en more than enough in order to be shared then you change the paradigm because it's not about reducing the access. It's about giving access. It's about sharing. It's about a gifting economy. It's about understanding 
that we have to be aware, that we have to be mindful, and then we are going to be transcending into this space of serving others. So I think that for some reason, at some point, we got it all wrong as humanity. We got it all wrong and because we reduced the access, we started to stop sharing, we started to become even more selfish about what we have has to be mine because otherwise I want to lose it. And that's something that got a ripple effect. And when you go into that state, then fear is the, is the main driver, is the fear of losing something. So I think capitalism is quite the opposite, is the joy of having an abundant and limitless mindset is expanding. And I say that the three key pillars of these paradigms are of this paradigm are based on freedom to be and actually be free from, from fear is consciousness and being aware of what's going on to expand yeah. and evolve and then is happiness to be shared. So those are the three ingredients. And then there is different ways to get to more happiness, to more consciousness and more freedom. And they start by self-compassion, by loving each other. But first of all, loving ourselves and understanding that we are full and whole from the beginning, that we are not lacking anything, that we already have everything. It's about sharing our humanity and knowing that everybody is struggling with something. And if somebody behaves in one way, it's because probably there is something going on that we don't know. We all struggle uh, at some point in life. Absolutely. And then it's about uh, sharing our joy and sharing our common humanity. So I think that this new paradigm, and I invite everybody to go deeper into, into that if they want, is, is basically a combination of believing that we have enough, that we understand when enough is enough, and that we are living in a society and in a world where we have to serve others. So I think when we understand that, I think that we are getting into a space where the currency becomes time instead of money. Yeah, uh, and time and time is beautiful because the the time is what we are missing now. Everybody is like we are all rushing, we are going faster somewhere, but we don't even know where we are going. Uh, so we are going faster nowhere. So uh, that's that's beautiful in the sense that, well, let's 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 do the opposite. Let's stop. I love that. I don't know you like diving. But diving is one of those sports. I love so diving. Real. Do you like yeah, it? I love diving. So diving, I mean, for those who don't, who don't know, who are listening, there are four steps into super secure diving. It's you are underwater and something happens. You have an issue. What is it that you do first? You don't rush, actually. Yeah. What you do is you stop. Yeah. So, so the first thing you do underwater, when there is an issue, you stop. What do we do in real life when there is an issue? We run. Everybody runs. Yeah. Everybody is like, okay, I, I'm going to be the first one because otherwise I'm going to die. Oh my gosh, that's so true. So that is, 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 is I think, is a, is a wisdom by itself. So what do you do first? You stop. What is the second thing that you do? You breathe. So you stop and you breathe. Yeah. And in real life, we forget even to, drip, to, to breathe. It's like oh, we run and we stop breathing. So yeah. that, that stop our thinking in many ways. So in diving, you stop, you breathe, and then you think. And after that, you act. Yeah. But there are three steps before you act. Stop, breathe, think. Exactly. Well, that that's that's in many ways capitalism. It's yeah. the truth. Come, let's yeah. be let's use the time. Let's use yeah. our time. And then let's exchange the time in an equal way. Mm. This podcast is an example. You are giving an hour, I'm giving an hour. Well, this is an equalizer. Yeah. Because we are spending the same time. Yeah. And now listeners are gonna be spending one time one hour 
Yeah, yeah. that is so well, true. So the the moment you start thinking in in a different way, currency is time. We have a an abundance mindset. This is about freedom to be, consciousness to expand, happiness to share. Then you start creating a new narrative, and and that's it. Uh, then you go deeper and deeper and deeper, and you enjoy the journey. Yeah, that's a great analogy because I think how often do we have to say, "Hey, I have to learn to breathe." You know, that's when you go diving. You have to learn to breathe underwater. Um, and and like you're saying, there's just a lot of step before you actually act. But in reality, when we go through any sort of crises or any situation, we just have the urge to act or react straight away. And if we think about diving as an analogy, then it's going to be really helpful, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I never thought of it that way, but you know, thank you so much for for sharing with us. And I think of all the ism that I've learned about so far, happy talism is definitely one of my favorites. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully, listeners have learned as much as I have about happy talism today. And you know, I really hope to see it become a, a real thing in in the near future because at the moment, not a lot of people talk about it yet. So, you know, hopefully, we'll we'll get. To hear about it more, and we'll, we'll get to hear the application and people actually taking it seriously because it's so important, you know. And and like you said, the only currency should be time. And there's so much more to do in life than just serving ourselves. We we are serving each other, and you know we are part of a society, right? And especially in the context of of the pandemic, we're going to get out of this together. So no man left alone, pretty much. Yeah. Thank you, Louie. This is really awesome. I've learned a lot from you today. And we have a couple more activities we want to do with you before we wrap. Um, the first thing we want to hear from you is we've talked about happiness. We've talked about the state of flow. We've talked about happy talism. But I know that you're passionate about many other things, one of which is actually in the background right there. Um, but, you know, here's your chance to share about anything that you're passionate about, anything that would bring some sort of values and insights to to people. So, you know, the stage is all yours. It doesn't have to be about happiness or it could be. It's totally up to you. Well, thank you so much. I mean, the first thing saying thank you because you're a wise woman and I love, I really love this conversation. You are really in the flow. Thank you. You embrace you embrace you 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 <laughs> the topic. Yeah. Um, for those who need a bit more of help, I invite you to check out uh, what we do at the World Happiness Fest. Uh, it's worldhappiness.foundation, and there you can see, and actually in March, from the 17th to the 20th, it actually is amazing. For the last 10 years, we have one day in the world, which is International Day of Happiness, and this is March 20th. So this March 20th, 2023, 24, 20, I mean, whenever, uh, we know that happiness is not just one day, it's every day. But if we have to remind somebody, I will, I will ask you to check it out and join the community. Because if you want techniques, tools, and access to other people who are going through the same journey as we all are going, finding those tools and activators to happiness, this, this is your community. So uh, I think that that's today my passion, is building communities is uh, bringing access to people who are suffering. And there are a lot of people right now. As you know, loneliness is is the, is, is really big pandemic. It's even beyond COVID. Absolutely. Uh, and, and this is a lot of mental health issues around the world. And I personally work every day with, with many people that are suffering a lot. Uh, they have persistent struggles. So we... We sometimes we talk about happiness about performance, linking to performance, but there is another component which is linked to trauma. Yeah. And and that's why it's so important. Because if we want to get out of trauma, we have to do things in a different way. So yeah, my passion right now is is right where I am. I am enjoying this so much and I invite everybody to yeah. become a happy best. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing. That's really beautiful. Yeah, we should all be happy tellers. 
Um, so Louis, thank you so much for joining us today. It was has been a real joy talking to you and learning about happiness as well as feeling uh, definite definite happiness today is a great thing that I've got and you're we're really grateful to have you on the show and for me I definitely learned a lot um, so we are excited to see what's going to happen in the next World Happiness Fest you know we're going to keep an eye out for happy tellism whenever we see it and hopefully talk about it more and we hope that we can have you back sometimes as well so thanks so much for joining absolutely thank you so much for doing this um, I'll see you very soon You've been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast, produced by the Happiness Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, Please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at ha.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Lu Ngo. Thanks for tuning in.